Amen. Amen. Uh, we've been in a series called Presence People, and if you're looking for a title of today's message, we're going to call this Revival is Coming. Yeah. Revival is Coming. Uh, turn with me to Ezekiel chapter 37 and look with me from verse 1, and we're going to go through this chapter verse by verse today. Here in Ezekiel 37, it starts by Ezekiel saying that the hand of the Lord was upon me, and he brought me by the Spirit of the Lord, and he set me in the middle of a valley, and it was full of bones, and he led me back and forth among them, and I saw a great many bones on the floor of the valley, bones that were very dry. Here, Ezekiel is having a nightmarish vision of these dry bones spread across the valley. It's a horrific Holocaust scene. It's the mess of a mass execution, and nobody was given even the dignity of a proper burial. And maybe you're one of those people that get the heebie-jeebies when you go to a cemetery where the bones are in the ground. How much more disturbing would it be if the bones are on the ground? When you read here, the context reveals that the Spirit of God is giving Ezekiel a guided tour. It's not a bird's eye view. He's on the ground and he's walking past the femurs. He's walking past the ribs. He, he just stepped over a skull and maybe if he misstepped, he heard a crunch. And the reason why these bones are so dry is because they've been so dead for so long. There have been people who've bounced back from a coma some people have even bounced back from stage four cancer, but we're talking about people who have been dead for decades. They aren't skin and bones. They're just bones. So let's keep reading. Verse three. And he asked me, son of man, can these bones live? And I said, sovereign Lord, you alone know. Now, Ezekiel could have given the rational answer to that question. He could have said, oh, these bones, you gave me the tour. Can they live? No way, Yahweh. <laughs> that would have been the rational answer. But Ezekiel didn't give the rational answer. He gave the right answer. The rational answer isn't always the right answer. He didn't give the scientific answer. He made room for the supernatural. He didn't give the probable answer. He was making space for what was possible. And I've discovered that in my own journey with God, if I'm only making decisions based off of what's rational, what's scientific, and what's probable, I may miss what God wants to do in and through my life. Amen. Sometimes God calls us to step out and walk on water, even though it doesn't make sense. But Ezekiel is somebody that God can work through because he is somebody who isn't jaded. He's not cynical, but he believes in the power of God. Basically, Ezekiel was telling God, God, it's your call. It's your call. If you want them to live, I believe they can live again. Uh, if you will it, I don't care how dry they are, how crunchy they are. If it's your will, there will be a revival. There will be a revival. So let's keep reading verse 4. And then he said to me, prophesy, not complain, not criticize, not describe, but prophesy to these bones and say to them, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord says to these bones. I will make breath enter you and you will come to life. Again, God didn't ask Ezekiel to criticize, complain, or to curse. I get in these you know, moments where I'm just so tempted to criticize. I, I, I'm just so tempted to complain. I, I, I want to curse. And yet, I need to remind myself, God is calling me to prophesy instead. God didn't ask Ezekiel to research and investigate and explain what happened. God asked him to prophesy. God was not asking him to dig into the past, but rather to declare the future. So let's not spend all of our time and energy researching how the enemy brought destruction. Rather, let's spend our time and energy declaring how God is about to bring redemption. Yeah. Amen. Let's not get stuck in the past. I think a few ways we get stuck in our past is we're mourning the death of something. We are blaming ourselves or others for something that has transpired. You know, we're scrutinizing or theorizing what went wrong and, and, and you know, being the mo Monday morning quarterback, as they say, 
But this is what the Apostle Paul wrote in Philippians chapter 3, verse 13. He says, I'm forgetting the things that are behind, and I'm reaching forth onto those things which are before. He said, and I'm going to let go of the things that are in the past. And I'm going to get excited about the things that God is about to do in my life. And that's what God is telling Ezekiel. Focus on what I am about to do. You don't have to make a documentary on what happened to these bones. You don't have to describe even the present state or, or the constitution of the bones. Rather, God is saying, Ezekiel, prophesy what God is about to do on the earth. And these bones... These dead, dry bones remind me of what the power of sin can accomplish. In Romans chapter 6, verse 23, it says that the wages of sin is death. And here, though, Ezekiel is commanded to talk to the bones, not about the power of sin, but about the power of God. Not about the power of sin, but prophesy to these bones about the power of God. I think sometimes we just want to beat up sinners for their sins, thinking that will change them. They may get enraged, but they will not be transformed. They may be shamed, but they will not be saved. If we're just preaching a message of shame and condemnation and just magnifying and glorifying the power of sin, you know, telling a dead bone that you're dead isn't going to revive them. Telling dead bones how they died and why they died isn't going to revive them. It's telling these dead bones what God in His grace and mercy is about to do that will cause those bones to begin to rattle. Not, you know, explaining the past, not even describing the present, but prophesying God's heart and God's intentions. In Romans chapter 15, verse 13, it says that God is the God of all hope. And it's when we declare a message of hope that comes from the God of all hope that dead bones begin to rattle. I hope we can hear what God is saying. There's power that's released when we say what God is saying. When we get in sync with God, that's when there's power. When we're repeating the revelation he gave us, there is power. And I hope we can hear what God is saying. He's saying, I'm about to fix this. I'm about to revive that. I'm about to transform them. I'm about to release my resurrection power. And I believe we, if we hear what the God of hope is saying, he's saying, I will not let the enemy outshine me. I'm not going to be outdone by sin and death. I will have the final word. I will bring a revival. I will bring a revival. So let's not glorify what the enemy did through the power of sin. Let's magnify what God's about to do by the power of his grace. That's what the Apostle Paul does in Ephesians chapter 2 verse 1. He starts by saying, as for you, you were dead in your trespasses and sins. You're like those dry dead bones. But then he goes on to say, but God in his great love for us, God who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ. Even when we were dead in our transgressions, it is by grace that you have been saved. Here he is magnifying what the grace of God will do over what the power of sin did. Now, Christians, we can be so afraid of sin. We can be so obsessed with sin management. And we, we keep beating ourselves up even now over the sins uh, of our past. And yet, I believe that we're supposed to magnify God's grace over our sin. In Romans chapter 5, verse 20, it says, Where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. You know, we're supposed to get so fired up about this coming revival that we forget about sin. We're supposed to be so enthralled with the presence of God. We're calling the series Presence People. That sin becomes an afterthought. Or how about this? Sin becomes a third shoe. Let's keep reading. Verse 7. So I prophesied as I was commanded. And uh, as I was prophesying, the difference came when he was prophesying. Complaining, cursing. Criticizing doesn't change anything. It's as I was prophesying. Some of us parents, we need to stop criticizing our kids and complaining about our kids. We need to start prophesying over them. We need to start cursing our families and we need to start prophesying over our families what God's heart and intent is. But he says, as I was prophesying, there was a noise. There was a rattling sound and the, the bones came together bone to bone. And by the way, this is the first miracle that these bones that were ripped apart and they were dying because they were on their own, they are now reuniting. 
Uh, you know, when we're ripped apart, we start to dry up. And remaining in isolation due to hurt and bitterness and resentment is not how we prepare for revival. I believe as we continue to release the heart of God, as we continue to prophesy, God is going to bring these bones together again. I think somebody is like a spare kneecap out in the desert somewhere, off on their own, and yet God is bringing you back. He, he wants us to attach to the body and here, verse 8, And I looked, and tendon and flesh appeared on them, and skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. And now the body has flesh, it has structure, yet it still needed breath. Which reminds us that meetings and organizations and systems and structure is needed, yet we need revival. Revival. We need more than systems and structure and organization. We need the breath of God. And I know how much planning goes into every Sunday we have together as a church here. And all of our services, our staff is meeting and we're always trying to upgrade what we do. And we're always communicating. We're trying to get organized. We're trying to get better. We're trying to do things with excellence. And yet, apart from the breath of God... Everything is vain. We need the breath of God. How many of you experience this? I've noticed that even in our services, you know, everything is set. The table is set. Uh, the sound system is, is intact. You know, um, the musicians have practiced. The greeters are stationed. And uh, here we are just kind of sitting here waiting. You know, we do the first song, maybe we, we, we do the second song, then all of a sudden at the third song, or maybe it's the fourth song, it's the breath of God. And all of us can sense, okay, the Spirit of the Lord is here. We need the breath of God. And we're supposed to call for it. We're supposed to prophesy for the breath to be released. The breath of God is the manifest presence of God. Not merely the omnipresence of God, but the experiential presence of God. When someone breathes on you, especially after they had garlic and uh, onions, it's an experience. It's not a theory. It's tangible. You know, <laughs> when someone you know, breathes into a balloon, there is a manifestation that we can witness. When someone blows out candles, there is a shift. Uh, you know, when somebody is laying unconscious and we breathe into them, they can be resuscitated. When the breath of God comes upon us, it's something that we tangibly experience. We're experiencing what is in Him and what is of Him. And it's the breath of God that brings the manifestation of His presence and His power. And His breath resuscitates us and brings life. His breath brings revival. Now here is the wild part. You know what the wild part is? And this blows my mind when I think about it. God wants to release his presence and power in cooperation with us. God is saying, Ezekiel, you speak and I'll move. You do something and I will do something. You follow my lead and I'll back you up. You know, yesterday at our outreach, we, um, what, what we love to do is pray with people. And I can't believe how many people are open to prayer. If you want to grow in praying for people, and, and you want to be in a setting where everybody says yes when you ask them if you can pray with them or for them, just come out and join us. Uh, be part of the Compassion Crew and uh, you know, join us on Saturday mornings. But uh, I love what God is doing with our youth. And our youth are excited about uh, the, the move of the Holy Spirit. Our, our youth are, are excited about the presence of God. Our youth are excited and believe in the power of God. So uh, up, up on the screen, you're going to see a, a little 30-second clip of what happened yesterday when we were just in cooperation with God. All right, let's go ahead and show the video. Oh, yeah. Um, me and Pastor Daniel, we prayed for this lady. Are you okay? We prayed for, um, we prayed for this lady. Um, I think her name was Martha. And she was having some trouble in her back, and we just prayed, and we asked for Jesus to heal her, and we believed yeah. together, and her back was healed. She could move it. She could just, it was strengthened. It was okay. us. It was God. That was super cool. <laughs> it was awesome.
I don't know if you caught her saying this, but she said, you know, through us and God, this lady got healed. Through us and God. It's a partnership. And I believe God wants to flow through his people. I believe it's his heart and intent, uh, generally speaking, to heal. And therefore, let's just make ourselves available and speak it. And as we speak it, he backs us up and releases his power and he breathes as we are in sync with God. As Ezekiel spoke, things began to shift. As he prophesied, the, the bones rattled. As he prophesied, uh, the bones came together. As he prophesied, a skin manifested. As he prophesied, flesh grew out. And, and I, I believe that the power was in him saying what God was saying. He was listening and then he was speaking. He wasn't just rambling his own feelings or he wasn't just ranting uh, his own opinions. No, he heard what God was saying. And I believe revival comes when we hear what God is saying and we begin to speak that forth. Now here, Ezekiel is commanded to command the wind of God to blow and the breath of God to come. Look with me in verse 9. This is the best part. Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath. Prophesy, son of man, and say to it, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Come, breath, from the four winds and breathe into these slain that they may live. So as I prophesied, as he commanded me, the breath entered into them and they came to life and they stood on their feet, a vast army. It's the breath of God that helps us get back on our feet. Some of us got knocked over. We got the wind knocked out of us, and we're just laying on our backs. We need the breath of God to get us back on our feet. Some of us have been babies way too long, just crawling and being pushed in a stroller. We need the breath of God to come upon us so that we can get back on our feet. The breath of God makes us into warriors. The breath of God doesn't uh, create wimps. In Acts chapter 1, verse 8, it says, You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And we become this huge army. And an army is willing to lay down their life for a cause. An army is propelled by a purpose that's greater than their own comforts and their own preferences and their own consumerism. A, a soldier is focused and is disciplined and is committed. And I, I just want to share a little difference between Building a family church versus an army church. We see that the breath of God came to create an army. And, you know, if you know anything about our vision here at the church, we, we do want to be one big loving family. And yet, we don't want to stop there. We want to raise up an army. Not just a family, but an army. A family consists of people who are related. An army, though, consists of many families, many leaders. A, a family is a, about taking care of each other. You know, we take care of our kids. If, if you have elderly parents, you're taking care of them. Uh, when we are younger, we're being taken care of. So family is about caring. But an army is about conquering. An army is on a mission. And so the purpose of Jesus Center is not just that we care for each other, but we conquer. But it's to conquer. We are on a mission. I know many families have family feuds and family splits. And, uh, you know, you start getting on each other's nerves and you just say, I'm not talking to you anymore. Armies can't afford division. The purpose is too great. The mission is too important. Families can help other families. But it's an army that can liberate cities. That can win nations and people groups. So our goal here at Jesus Center is not just to stay a hospital with people on their backs. Our goal here at Jesus Center is not just to be a restaurant with church connoisseurs that we're trying to please, with entitled customers. The goal of Jesus Center is not just to be a daycare where we have these babies and where we're all fighting over the same toys. My toy, my toy, my department. But to be an army 
And that is what the breath of God creates. That is what the breath of God accomplishes. How we ended up coming to pioneer this ministry in the South Bay was I got a word from heaven that revival is coming to the South Bay. And that's what led us to move out here and start in our humble beginnings and to witness God move in this region. But it all started with a word from heaven that revival is coming to the South Bay. And I know some of you are like, no, that was the pizza you ate the night before, Daniel. That was not God. I mean, he doesn't speak. He just speaks through the Bible. Okay, let's look at the Bible. In 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, it says that God desires that none should perish, but that all would come to repentance. Let's look at the Bible. Acts chapter 2 verse 17 says, I will pour out my spirit in these last days upon your sons and daughters, upon all flesh, and they will prophesy. That is what the word says. So I have enough scripture to believe that God's will for the South Bay is revival. And since I know that, since I believe the word of the Lord, I'm not going to be complaining about this land. I'm not going to be criticizing my region. I don't even need to write a 3,000-page book on how we became a spiritual graveyard. I don't need to dig up past scandals and past splits that took place on this soil. Rather, I need to know the heart of God. It's to bring revival, and I need to believe it, and I am supposed to prophesy. Revival is coming to the South Bay. Amen. Can somebody say that with me right in your seat? Revival is coming to the South Bay. We're supposed to be prophesying. We're supposed to be prophesying. God wants to work through a people who will put his word in their mouth and they will release it. Not talk fleshly things, not get into our own opinions and speak out of our own wounds, but we'll speak the word of the Lord. And as I get excited about this revival that's coming, as I keep uh, declaring God's heart, as I keep prophesying to these dead bones and that these bones will live again, as I keep calling for the wind, as I keep praying for the breath of God, I begin to hear the bones rattle and I begin to see the regathering of the disjointed and I begin to see the Spirit of God bringing forth transformation in people's lives just like we saw up on the screen. And I do believe an army will be raised up and army that is full of this revelation that greater is he that's in me than he that is in the world. It's going to be an army that's compelled by the love of Christ. It's going to be a compassion army. It's going to be an army that walks in humility, uh, that is clothed in honor, that understands unity and order and strategy. And it's going to be an army that fears nothing but God, full of faith and full of the Holy Spirit. It's going to be an army that's not just going after churchgoers. It's an army that's going after true disciples of Jesus Christ. It's going to be an army that's healing the sick, raising the dead, cleansing the lepers, casting out demons, and preaching the good news of the gospel of the kingdom. And it's going to be an army that pushes back the darkness. We're going to drive out poverty. We're going to destroy sickness. We're going to... Uh, destroy perversion and depression and oppression that's upon our land and we're going to see the kingdom of God come and dead bones come to life again. Amen. Amen. I believe I'm in a room full of Ezekiel's and we're supposed to be prophesying about this coming revival and this army that's going to be raised up Amen. Amen. I'm excited about it. You know why God wants to breathe upon these dry bones? Is it because they deserve it? Or is it because he in his grace and mercy just wills it? I believe it's in his heart to restore and revive the people he loves. Is he going to breathe upon these dry bones because those dry bones have been striving Exercising, taking their protein shakes, popping their vitamins. No, they're without strength. And God's saying, I'm going to raise them up anyway. I'm going to raise them up anyway. Maybe you're here today and you feel like you have no strength. And you feel like you're dead. You're, you came in here and you say, I have a dead heart. I, I have dead faith. Let's invite the worship team. You say, I have this dead relationship with God. And 
And yet I prophesied that you are a candidate for the breath of God. Can we stand together?